It is, it's great to be here worshiping our Lord with God's people. Um, preparing the sermon, reading chapter 9 of the Gospel of John, uh, which I love dearly because it speaks to me with such force and power. The thought came to, to me, I usually do this sermon as a theory piece. Uh, it's totally different to a sermon proper. So I decided to prepare the sermon in a totally different perspective, but I also needed to, to have some experience on what black uh, darkness looks like. How the blind person in chapter nine felt and how he lived. Mind you, the experiment was, I don't know, five to 10 minutes long, but this is what I did. And by what I'm going to share, please, don't try any one of you to do it what I did. So as I was reading this portion of the Gospel of John, I decided to buy myself a mask, a black mask that uh, stops light from coming. So I was, I live in a two story house and I was up in the second floor in my office. So I put on the mask and in reality, it was dark. I couldn't, I couldn't see anything. But since I'm familiar with space, I thought that I saw some light. So I decided to get a, a black shirt and I put it all over my face, I tied it. And I thought that was not black enough. So I have a heavy winter black sweater. So I put it, I finished that with that. And I sat on my chair for about 15 minutes. And as time went by, I, my brain began to get disorientated. So at that point, I decided to go down to the first floor and see what was going to happen. So basically, darkness is the absence of light. That's what it is. It's nothingness, you could, nothing, absolutely nothing. So I put my hand on the wall and I began to, to the hallway, there is a handrail, I went to that and I set up myself to go down the stairs. I know where the staircase is, I know that by heart. And I went and down, I got to the landing and on the landing has step. And I began to doubt myself. Should I go ahead and take that extra step? Going down and suffer the consequences. But as bright as I am, I began with my feet, I began to count steps slowly until I got to the edge. I felt it and I did this. So I knew exactly how to step down. And I stepped on the floor and I was able to bring my other foot down and I made the, um, a right turn to go to the kitchen. I was cocky enough that nothing was going to happen. On going to the kitchen in the hallway, there is a tiny, I don't know, about three inches piece of marble that goes into, that makes the separation to the kitchen. And I forgot to take that into consideration 
and I almost fell. So praise the Lord, nothing happened. I went to the kitchen, and that's when I got lost. Since I couldn't see anything, I couldn't move. I was paralyzed, not with fear, but with uncertainty, because I came to the world of nothingness, emptiness, and no direction. So this guy, I'm going to call him Matan, and in Hebrew means a, a gift. Matan, and I'm going to give him about 30, let's say 35 years of age. Or let me say 30. All his life has been blind. Blind from birth. But what is blindness? And how many kinds of blindness are there? I may come blind from a, some accident. I may lose my sight for many reasons. Which brings us to what it is a spiritual, what is a spiritual blindness? So which will lead us to physical gloom. What is physical vision and will that interfere with a spiritual light? Spiritual light comes from a totally different source. Physical light comes from light, natural light as we know it. John chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man of, or his parents, that he was born blind. Isn't it a wonderful, deep theological question? Were the disciples right to ask about sin and its consequences? Yes. They want to learn. They want to discover. They want to understand the world. They want to th understand also the physical and the spiritual world. They want to learn and discern. They want to see the heart and the power of Jesus. But the disciples' questions exposes the thought that in ancient Judea, sin and suffering could be traced um, to sin, as Job chapter 4 tells us. But the fundamental concern on this conjecture is to absolve God from an of wrongdoing against innocent people. So, in a way, we want to help God to be who he is. And that's based on Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, Numbers 14, verse 18, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 9. Yet the good news makes clear that suffering is not always a direct result of a person's sin. Luke chapter 13, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Galatians chapter 4. We must not speculate about the foundation of a person's suffering, but understand that even evil contributes to the magnanimous, the magnanimous glory and mercy of God. And that's when we see uh, the crucifixion. But what? we see at the end of the crucifixion is eternity, life eternal with God. Chapter John of t chapter 12 of John, 37, verse 27, 45, verse 17, and going and on. Within Judaism, it is common for students to ask our rabbis 
our trusted teachers questions that will help resolve the veracity of our situation, our own knowledge, and biblical truth. Judaism's concept of sin differs from the whole world. So within the world of the Gentiles and believers, they will qualify sin as original sin. And within Judaism, that idea of original sin doesn't exist. For Israel, the Messiah covenant became the first a kit for the people. God restricted the transgressions of our wicked hearts. Our hearts are affected by the evil society all around us. However, the new covenant raises the bar much higher, setting the standard as far back as in the days of creation, the ultimate perfection and perfect will of God. In the Messiah Covenant, we are encouraged, we are commanded to stay away from sin. That means not to break the commands, such as not hurting your neighbor. However, under the good news, the New Testament, the covenant is totally different. And that is not enough. It is no longer enough. James chapter 4, verse 17, quote, For one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, for him it is sin. I'm going to paraphrase this slightly. If you see your neighbor in need and you do not help him, you sinned. You willingly neglected the will of God. So Jesus places the truth, his truth, in front of us, and then we are helpless, or, or are we? In Hebrew, the word hatat, sin, literal, literally means to miss. From that, the Hebrew speaker understands that to sin means to miss the mark, to miss the will of God. Rabbis assign certain physical disabilities from birth as the consequence of fetus mischief. While this may appear ridiculous, it comes close to the Christian doctrine of original sin. Let me try to explain this. There couldn't be original sin because it, with that thought, we are telling that sin pre-existed creation or sin pre-existed God, which cannot be possible. I would make a joke about this. Can I? I can't. How can I joke about sin? Now, within Judaism, the concept of sin is totally different. We have two natures, the Yetzir Hara, the evil inclination, and the Yetzir Hatov, the good inclination. And the struggle within begins the moment that we begin to have conscious or we begin to be conscious and understand the world those two aspects of our inner beings begin to fight each other they check each other so if i want to do something that's wrong the yeser hatov the good inclination would come and engage my evil inclination in battle. And usually the good inclination will win. What if it, the other wins? The thought, the Jewish theological thought, 
will teach us that we will sin in order to learn that sinning is not correct. Jesus the, redefines for us the concept of human suffering and sin. Suffering is, is the result of sin. Keeping the will of God, not sinning, goes much deeper and much further than not murdering someone or robbing a bank. We miss God's will in more ways than we begin to realize. We miss God's will in our standard of living, in our cultural practices, in our way of thinking, in what we say, in what we eat, in what we buy, and in many other behaviors. We miss the will of God. We miss the mark in every everyday actions that we don't even stop to think about. So in, in other words, we are hopeless. We are lost. Jesus reconsiders the works of God against a fallen natural world. Jesus declares himself as the healer redeemer. Moses asked to see God's glory. He, he couldn't. Yeshua says, watch God's glory in action. Jesus is glory personified. Verse 3, Yeshua answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. This happened so that the works of God might be brought to light in him. We must do the work of the one who sent me, so as long as it is day, night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Do you know what he's doing here? The chutzpah of Jesus, Yeshua, declaring himself to be not. A mere mortal. He says, in other words, I am so long as it is they he is to do the works of him who sent him. He says, night is coming when no one can work. Question. If you see what's going on in the world right now, would you see that we live in a world filled with light? Are we humans diminishing God's light? Are you whom you have in your heart the Holy Spirit allowing him to shine through you then yes the question the answer to that question should be yes i am the light of the world because jesus the holy spirit lives in my heart so jesus statement shakes the foundation of the world when you flick a switch you have light. Even when your, even your cell phone nowadays will serve you as a light. I think they have, they call it a torch up or whatever. You all you have to do is push that button and voila, you have light. So light is all over the place, isn't it? But. Which is more powerful, physical light, man-made light, or the light of the world? So we get frantic. Sometimes I'm working, and suddenly the lights goes off, and I'm frantic. What's going on? When, when is the light going to come? I cannot wait. 
So at that point, I get up from my chair, go down, and take a walk. By the time I come back, my house has light, and I can continue doing whatever I'm doing. Now, take Jesus away from you and see what happens. Jesus was saying that he is the source of light that pushes back darkness and let us see so that we also can do the works of God. Darkness, blindness. This section shouts for you to turn away from your fixation on fate as the pivotal reason for suffering. Turn away from surrendering to futility. Walk away from absurdity. Reject chaos and insignificance. Stop missing the mark. This ref reference to light describes Yeshua as the way. Jesus is the transporter of the good news up to his resurrection and up to his de departure. When he left his apostles and their disciples, and you became the light of the world, bringing truth to the world, giving sight to the spiritual death and to the spiritual blind. Obedience always leads to restoration. When we come to him, the first thing that he does is remove a lot of garbage from you, and he begins the process of restoring your soul and your physical body. Chapter 6, having said this, these things, he spat on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud on the blind man's eyes. And he told them, go wash in the pool of Siloam, or Siloam, which translated as scent. So he went away, washed, and came back seen. Magnificent, isn't it? Glorious. Correct. However, do we doubt? The Pharisees did. What? This chapter is filled with irony and with humor. That when you read it slowly, you will you will catch everything and you will laugh. This is an act of renewal of a dilapidated world. Living creatures and nature suffer the wages of sin. Yet we see hope. We see restoration. We experience deliverance. Jesus spit on the dust and out of it, the dust he made clay. He applies the mud to the eyes of the person. Do you wonder why? Well, my personal opinion, Jesus is showing us that he has the power to heal. He has the power to repair, and he has the power to restore. He has the power to give us light and life. But who would believe that joy will turn into grief. The man rejoices over the works of God. Now, picture this. He goes to the pool of Siloam, as he was told. He washes, he looks up, and he's able to see. Okay. If we understand that the blind person never saw anything. Perhaps his fathers or brothers, if he had um, brothers, could explain to see what a house looked like, what a person looked like. He would have known certain things by the touch of his hands. Reading and investigating, I learned that uh, 
if you are partially blind, you can perceive certain things, but you can, you're not able to recognize them. So when, when your sight is restored, then the person needs to be taught how to see. That sounds strange, doesn't it? Because he, he's not seeing every day. It's, it's, um, things are unfamiliar. So here it is, Matan, standing at the Pool of Siloam and looking at the city, at the vastness of space, looking from the city of David across, looking at the Temple Mount, and looking at that huge building that he knows because he's been told about those things, and wondering and praising God in his heart. And he recognizes everything at once. So restoration is total, including knowledge. That's what happens to Matan. He is able to recognize absolutely everything. He contemplates Jerusalem, the city of gold and the temple, all in God's glory, magnificent creation. However, he's going to run into problems as if he hadn't suffered enough. Disappointment, excommunication, new life. Yeah, new life. As Yeshua healed the man born blind. He anticipated those witnessing the event to connect it with God's creation of man. God created man from the dust of the ground and Jesus' healing act is a redemptive act, an act of restoration, an act of recreation performed by the word by God himself, Jesus, healing of the blind person is supreme and has immense significance. We must understand that it is not simply a healing. It is the act of creating a new man using mud out of the dust God created, using dust out of using dust out of the earth God created Adam so he takes us all the way back to creation Yeshua restored he gave life he gave life life to the newly restored man a ticket to a renewed kingdom Verse 8, and I'm going to read verse 8 to 16. And here's how the Inquisition begins. His neighbor and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, Isn't this the man who used to sit in bed? Some said he was, and others said, No, he looks like him. He just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the one. They asked, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they call Jesus Yeshua made mad and spread it over my eyes and he told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and now I see. Where is he now, they asked. I don't know, he replied. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees, to the leadership, to the Jewish religious leaders, to the Sanhedrin, because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it. So he told them, he put mud over my eyes, and when I washed, it away I could see. Now some of the Pharisees said this man Jesus is not from God for he is working on the Sabbath. 
Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep, deep, deep division and opinion among them. Ah, oh, I love this. Jesus causes division. Jesus will create chaos in your house when you become a believer. When I became a believer, I told my mom, but she said, forget about me, you don't exist, you're dead. We didn't talk, we, we didn't talk for years. Now this guy <laughs> knows something about religion as it were. He knows about something about the synagogue. He knows something about the temple. He's not allowed into those places, but he knows. The authorities refused to believe that the man, in fact, was blind. They called in witnesses that would validate and assuage their growing suspicion that this was a hoax. No one would know the blind person better than his parents. Ah, the witness of his parents. Would that be helpful? Let us discover a bit more. Verse 19, they asked them. <clears throat> so they called the parents to the office and it's not a friendly conversation, right? It's an inquisition. They asked, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind. But we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him, he is old enough to speak for himself. I just love it. Oh. Here I am, I'm being questioned. And my greatest response will say, why are you asking me? Ask him, right? He's old enough. I know he's my son, but hey, he's out of the house now. The persecution of Yeshua's followers had already begun way back then. And the prime, prime, the prime method of persecution was to expel the followers and sympathizers of Jesus from the synagogues, from life in the temple, from their congregations. They were excommunicated. At that time, and it continues even today, let me share with this. A young Jewish man called Diophis, and he wanted to talk to someone. I called him, and we met. He is an Orthodox Jewish guy that believes in Jesus. So he was a secret believer within the community. But Something happened, he was discovered, and he was kicked out of the community, not only from the synagogue, but from the Jewish community itself. And they told him that he stopped being Jewish. <clears throat> That's a high price to pay, isn't it? Or is it? From my human perspective, yes, it is. Because I made my life with the Jewish community. I grew in the Jewish community. I learned from the Jewish leaders, from my Jewish rabbis. But now, I'm left all alone. It's for the first time that I'm going to be able to go to the temple to present myself to the high priest so that he may consider, consider me healed, cleansed, 
and ready to come to the Vethamidash, the holy temple, and worship. That everything is gone. Because someone decided that it should be so. A precious, powerful witness ready to accept the outcome. He won't give in. Verse 35, when Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked them, do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Listen how he responds. Yes, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Yeshua. Yes, I believe. And the next step is to worship the master of the universe. In my personal opinion, the man's blindness from birth teaches us the deeply tarnished condition of hurting sheep, the people of Israel, and all the world that lives in darkness. Therefore, giving sight to the eyes of the blind man was prophetic, was a prophetic sign of giving light to all Israel and to the whole wide world. Giving his light represents the spiritual and physical re regeneration of the human being and the human heart. Both the healing and the ultimately redemptive works of Yeshua had to be carried out quickly to ease the burden of God's people who were suffering oppression from the leadership and from every single side. I'm just fascinating, and this is just fascinating, and I am fascinated at the work of God and how Jesus will go out of his way to reach you, to touch you, to heal you, to bless you, to kiss you, and give you eternal life. An eternal life. See, physical light, it is not a spiritual light. Spiritual light will give you physical light. And that is who Jesus is and what he does. So let me ask a question, my final question. Are you in his light? Are you in his heart? My final question is he in your life and in your heart. Father, you're awesome. And I thank you, Lord, for being here first. You were waiting patiently for us to come up and open the door, not even realizing that you were here waiting for us to give us ministry. to calm our spirits, to prepare us for the message, to enter into closer fellowship with you. Father, as we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts and he is the light of the world, as Jesus and the Father, Father, I pray that you will empower us to share you with the lost. Father, I, I pray that you will just
touch our hearts and fill it with your love so that we and with your power so that we will be bold enough to share the gospel with you and with each Gentile. As the more people come into the kingdom, the lesser the time we have to be here. Lord, I don't know what your people need this morning, but you do. And my prayer, Lord, is that you will touch them individually, that you will whisper in their ears, it is done. I'm with you. I will never leave nor forsake you. I pray for Jorge as he is in meetings with the board. I pray for Brian as he continues to lead the congregation in the liturgy. I pray for the readers that, Lord, that you will reveal yourself to them every time that they read the scriptures. I pray for everybody that desires to have a closer fellowship with you. And it is in the mighty name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, and your people say,